Hello, lovely listeners. Um, this is Mel, Mel Clark, and welcome to my podcast, the Never Settle podcast. And up till now, I've been doing interviews and I thought perhaps it was time to introduce myself properly and give you the reasons why I wanted to start this podcast in the first place. Um, forgive me if this goes all over the place because I'm just talking to myself basically. Um, and I'm new to the old podcast, so I'm still improving, hopefully. So um, I suppose the background of me and, and where this podcast came from. So for me, you know, right from a, a young age, I always knew that A, that I was different in terms of the way I thought to other people. I always knew from a young age, I didn't want to repeat the marriage of my mum and dad. Um, God rest my dad's soul. And, and, and I think my mum is aware of that. I'm sure she, well, she is aware of that. Um, and I felt very strongly about that, you know, because they, they had, they were happy enough, but they had their rows. They had a lot of rows and there was a lot of unhappiness. And, you know, as a very sensitive child, um, I hated it. Um, and, you know, as I was a teenager and, and getting older, I didn't want to be in the house um, when the energy was so black. That was how it used to feel to me. So I would always be out with friends or, yeah, with friends mainly or, or doing hobbies or whatever. Um, I just couldn't stand it. So as I got older, um, I went to uni, although I didn't end up living away at uni. I, I, I did for two weeks and then came back. That's a story for another time. Um, so I ended up living at home, doing university and having two jobs at the same time, partying, um, party central and trying to do everything, which is pretty much um, how I've lived my life doing, juggling too many balls, as my dad used to say, and that really still hasn't stopped. <laughs> um, but I think um, in terms of shaping me, that was, you know, the, the desire to, the desire to, to want to be happy when I got older was huge. The desire to have money was huge because my parents, we weren't poor, but we always just sort of got by um, because my dad was self-employed and he was in and out of work and all of that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, so sometimes it was tough, sometimes it was better. And when I finished uni, I went, I, I fell into a, a job that um, lasted, uh, I don't know, about a year. And then I fell into sales. And sales was my first real, um, you know, avenue into understanding how to earn money. Because obviously you've got your basic, you've got the ability to earn commission. And, and anybody listening or watching that has been in sales or is in sales knows what it's like. Because once you get into it, it's really hard to get out of it because you become dependent on having that commission. But... There was always this drive in me. So, you know, I didn't, I did psychology at uni. When I was at uni, I thought I was going to be a psychologist. And then when I graduated, I thought, who's going to listen to a 23 year old girl that's got no life experience? So I taught myself out of it and thought, oh, I best get myself a proper job and all that. Um, but there was always a desire, you know, every step I've taken in, in life, there's always been a huge desire to succeed or to earn money or to do something different. So the first proper job um, or the first proper sales job and was great. I had, I had a right laugh, brilliant training that set me up for a, a sales career, which I'm still in um, to a point. And the ability to earn money was there, which gave me the nicer things in life. It wasn't always easy. You know, I, I wasn't always in Clover, but um, that was where I was going. And then I joined a band 
So I've always loved singing, I've always loved music. And again, taught myself out of that at school from an incident that happened uh, from a, just a, a, a rogue lad in my class, made a throwaway comment one day when we were all performing and it floored me and stopped me doing anything for 10 years, probably. And um, it was a chance encounter with a friend of a friend who was, who read Palms that basically told me that I was holding myself back from a dream. And I knew exactly what she was on about. And from that point on, I started looking in, as it was back, the classifieds in the paper. And there, lo and behold, there was a band advertising. And no, that's not true. I did, I did end up joining a couple of other bands first, which were short lived and not, not ideal. Um, and then I found um, this band called Champagne Hedgehog who became um, a much longer uh, journey for me in terms of gigging and recording and going around the country and all that wonderful stuff. So, um, but, but that kind of, you know, I always saw myself as being at Wembley Stadium or us at Wem Wembley Stadium or Top of the Pops as it was back then. Um, but ultimately, I don't think any of us truly believed in ourselves in terms of what we could actually achieve. And that was what went against us. Um, and then I met a guy um, just, was it? Yeah, just before I graduated. And because I was going to go traveling from university, that postponed my travel journey, uh, travel plans. And then and then basically um, a year into it uh, or a year and a half into it, we got pregnant and kept it, had my little boy Jake, um, even though it was all a bit scary and I wasn't ready for it and neither was he. And um, managed to muddle along with the band still. Uh, me and the dad didn't stay together. I became a single mum and I think Jake was uh, about two, two and a half. By the time I said to myself, do you know what, I can't do everything. I can't be a single mom. I can't work full time and I can't be in a band. So the band had to go, unfortunately. So, so that left quite a, a hole in terms of my desires. And by that point I'd met um, uh, another guy who had actually gone to school with and he eventually became my husband a few years later and then a few years later became my ex-husband but um when we were together i started and and i started my dad's health um i noticed was was not brilliant at times he'd had a couple of strokes in his 50s and stuff and um but i also knew that pension wise they were screwed because he'd been self-employed most of his life they hadn't got any savings so I started to see things coming through for property development. And that was what started me on the, the property journey, which I did. And I dragged my older brother into it. And um, we did. We basically, we ended up getting three buy to let properties. This was back in um, the, the end of 2003 into 2004. We ended up buying three buy to let properties within six months with none of our own money um, using things like credit cards and gifted deposits as it was back then um, and some creativeness with the mortgages so it nearly killed us but um, we managed to make it work and I thought I was set you know great we're on the property ladder I mean I'd already got a property myself that I was living in but I thought, yeah, we're going to get to 100 properties because that was when, you know, the prices just kept doubling and doubling. And, um, and then we got all of that working. And in 2007, well, I lost my father in 2006. And in 2007, because one of the dreams that mom and dad had was to have a, their, a place in Spain. And I started to get emails. and. Um, basically that I was going on a motion because you know I knew it was a, a thing of my dad's 
so I started to look into it. We, we, me, my mum and my partner then, who became my husband, uh, we went out and uh, almost bought a place. And anyway, we changed our minds and backed out. And then a few months later, ended up going out and instead of buying one place, we bought two, almost bought three. Uh, and this was in 2007. And um, it was crazy. It was whatever, but we did it. It cost us way more than we thought it was going to. I don't know if anybody's ever bought in Spain, but there's a lot of taxes. Um, and also, ultimately, the way that it was all set up, you know, I didn't do my due diligence. We used to go out there and basically have a party, get pissed. Um, the sales agent knew exactly what he was doing. And um, it was all great fun and, you know, nothing was going to stop us. Anyway, so uh, that was in 2007. We had a whole host of problems, you know, crop lesson agents, uh, a family that trashed the place, um, just one thing after another. And then 2008 was when the, the crash started to happen and the recession started to kick in. Um, and that just made, made it untenable over there um, after a while because a lot of the, the Brits were coming back, which was you know, partly funding how we were letting the place out. Um, anyway, so I'm not going to go into all of that, but needless to say, it didn't end well. And um, for a while, I thought I was going to have to go bankrupt, um, which look, luckily I didn't and managed to tread water long enough to get through it. But through the recession, you know, I ended up out of work. I had loans and credit cards coming out my ass, quite frankly um and ended up having to go into a debt management scheme because i couldn't get a job to pay me what i was getting paid before and quite frankly i was tired of juggling the balls and paying uh, i mean i must have had 10 credit cards and god knows how many loans at the time and um it had just become unbearable so I basically surrendered, went into this debt management and um, yeah, that, that was a struggle for, for quite a while. And the reason why I'm telling you all this, so, so I, just to finish that story. So I, in the meantime, um, I got married and uh, I was working part time. I was in this debt management. The hubby was um, okay with it all. He'd got a fairly decent job at the time. And, um, and we went along and still kept the UK properties, still got them now. And um, yeah, and I, I tried different things. I was always looking for something different. I was always, you know, the property was one thing. The, then I was getting into network marketing and multi-level marketing, um, tried a few different opportunities there. Did all this while I was working part-time. Also thought it'd be a great opportunity to try and get into music full-time. Did I really try that hard for that? No, probably because I didn't really believe in myself. And um, yeah, sort of middled along for a while. And then basically through all of that, after a, uh, again, another divine intervention um, was introduced to an acupuncturist who basically has changed my life ever since in terms of the reason why I'm going into so much detail with all of this is because the way I was feeling all my life was I was going to be the best. I was going to end up at, you know, Wembley Stadium, all this sort of stuff. But ultimately, I, I had the drive. I didn't have the belief. And so everything I did didn't quite get there, didn't quite make it. It was good, but it was never the best. It was never never got me to that next level. So I was always looking for something property I thought was going to be it until obviously we invested in Spain. And then that basically paralyzed me for about five years um, when all that crashed down. And, um, but I was always, I've always been looking for something else because I've never wanted to settle for the norm, I guess. I've never, I've always wanted to be able to give my boy who's now, unbelievably 21 um literally a few days ago 
I always wanted to be able to give him the best. I always wanted to be able to give him more. And I think I was coming from a place, well, from completely the wrong place. Um, because when I ended up being broke and in a debt management scheme, it gave me the opportunity. And it was actually, it was actually a, um, a conscious choice to go part-time. A, because I was so tired of juggling the balls and managing the ridic ridiculous credit cards I'd got. But B, because I, I'd recognised at that point, because Jake then was about nine or ten, um, that I'd always been working, you know, and chasing my ass, And it was, you know, racing home to do dinner and pick him up and just be knackered, you know, in terms of not really being present enough because I was always so thinking about what else I had to do. So yeah, so I actually took that opportunity to slow down and I used to walk him to school. I used to, we used to cycle to school. We used to pick his mate up on route. Um, and, I, and I was doing home cooking and making soups and doing all the homely mom stuff rather than the race around the country, single mom, knackered mom. Um, and um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I didn't enjoy not earning the money, but it was fine. You, you know, you always have a compromise somewhere. So, so yeah, so through that time, um, it was, a, it was down tools. I was introduced to this acupuncturist because I suffer with my skin and, um, it was really bad back then in terms of, I've got something called acne rosacea, which i um, very often get red. Um, but I had a lot of spots as well. So, uh, anyway, had a few sessions with this wonderful lady called Claire who had just um, qualified and when we got to the fifth session which was the end of the introductories she basically said to me right at this point uh, some people are going to cut and run but my interest is in healing mind body and spirit I'm not interested in symptoms I'm interested in you as a whole and that's going to involve digging a bit deeper and maybe, you know, facing stuff that you haven't wanted to face. And I looked at her and I said, you know what? I'm in. And um, she said, right, okay. She goes, so I just have to tell you, you are deeply unhappy. And I looked at her. At this point, I was married one year. And I was like, I don't know what you're on about. I've been married a year, I'm very happy. And she went, I just have to say it as I say it, and you are deeply unhappy. And I kid you not, it was like somebody got a sledgehammer and cracked it over my head. It was, I don't know, I can't explain it, but the next thing I was sobbing in tears. And it was like, just those words and somebody, I'm getting emotional now thinking about it, somebody seeing in me what I'd chosen to ignore and cover up and put the layers around for years um, was, well, it was life-changing. It wasn't pretty. I remember she had to end the session because she had another client come in. And I went home all confused, but ultimately knowing where it was coming from. Um, because what I haven't mentioned yet is, although I married my husband, I had never got over somebody that I'd met when I was 20 years old. And I got married when I was 35. Um, and I'd, I'd always kept him in my heart, he'd never gone. But I basically got to a point, I mean, it was no good for me. Um, we were more off than on, but it was that deep, passionate, for me anyway, it was that deep, passionate love affair, that feeling that you, I've never experienced before, and I, I've never experienced since. Um, that feeling that you just can't, you can't forget. And, because of that, and knowing that I couldn't have him, 
um, you, you basically dust yourself off and you keep living, you know, and when I met Jake's dad, I was still, still, you know, in the throes of that. He never stood a chance. And, and then I met my husband who we'd been sort of, we'd been sweet on each other at school, but we'd, we'd never done anything about it. And actually he'd moved to Australia for five years um, until he'd had an accident, which brought him back to the UK. So that was, you know, divine intervention, if you like, how we basically ended up meeting in a nightclub one night. But um, this thing was always there in the back of my mind and in my heart and in the back of my mind and in my heart and, and just wouldn't go away. So that was the start of me unraveling, basically. And Jesus was the tears. There was lots of tears. It was like, you know, that sledgehammer had cracked a little, I don't know, crack in my head, which turned into a gully. And it was just like, it was just never ending. And it, it basically brought me to the realization of, you know, where I was in terms of my marriage and not being happy and realizing I'd done it for the wrong reasons. And, um, yeah. And, and then dealing with all of that and dealing with the sheer responsibility of that, because ultimately when he proposed, I know how I felt when he proposed and it wasn't, Oh my goodness. Yes. Wow. This is me for the rest of my life. That's not how I felt, but I said, yes. And we celebrated and it felt wonderful when we celebrated and, and then I got caught up in the whole thing and it all felt great and it all felt fine and it felt right. And I think looking back, you know, I believed back then that I, yeah, this is it. This is me. This is, I'm sorted. Um, but what I hadn't realized was I, I just was building the layers and I wanted it to be the right thing as opposed to it being the right thing. So, and I, I ignored a lot of signs. Um, the venue we booked burnt down for a start, <laughs> which, um, which delayed the wedding uh, for a year. Um, my son did not want me to get married to him. He used to cry of an evening when I put him to bed and, and basically tell me that he wanted, to get, wanted me to get back with daddy. But I was like, well, you don't even remember, I never said this to him, but you don't even remember me with daddy. You know, Jake was only a few months old when we split up. And he was one year old when we finally, um, when I finally left the house, because we bought a house together. So that used to confuse me. And it wasn't until after me and uh, my husband um, did split up properly that uh, my son Jake said to me, it wasn't because I wanted you to get back with daddy. It's because I didn't like John and I didn't want you to marry John, you know, and all this stuff came out afterwards and it was like, Oh my God, Jesus Christ. I was doing it all for what I thought were the right reasons to have a stable family, you know, mom and dad. And not that he was ever going to be dad because he's got Jake's got his own dad, but you know, and, and I wanted another child and all that, which never happened. And, these were all things I was forcing on Jake that he didn't even want. Um, but anyway, I feel I've digressed a little bit, but it's all part of the story. So, um, so yeah, so, so that meeting with the acupuncturist and I still see her now on and off all these years later, uh, I've been seeing her what, nine years, eight, nine years, something like that. Um, changed my life forever. And what it actually did Everything that she said, and in the subsequent uh, appointments I had with her after that, over the next two years, until I finally had the courage to say what I needed to say to my husband. Um, no, to be fair. Yeah, it was, it was another two years. Um, so she used to say things to me that I didn't want to hear that I didn't agree with and I wasn't ready to hear. And, um, I know all that now, but at the time I didn't, but I stuck with it. But ultimately there was a deep knowing in me 
that I wanted more, that I knew, I know that in terms of love and relationships, that you can have it all. Not that I've had it all. I felt like I had it all with that one amazing um, relationship that wasn't amazing. It felt amazing at times when it was good, but when it was bad, I was bereft and bloody crying and depressed. Um, and I built it up into this rose bubble that it just wasn't. Um, but I still know my heart of hearts that you can have it all, you know, and there are people that have got it all. No, nobody's perfect. Nobody, no relationship is perfect. I know that I'm not naive, but I do know that it's possible. And that has always kept me going. I also know that you can have what you want in life in terms of career, the way you choose to live your life, whether it be travel, whether you want to live in a hut, um, money, you know, we all, most of us, money evades us most of our life because we're living in a state of lack. We're thinking about everything we haven't got as opposed to feeling abundant with what we have got. Um, you know, that picture behind me, that is, that is all my family. Um, many years ago, that's Jake in the front when he was only two and a half. It was his christening and he's now 21. So you, you do the maths. Um, but that's my wonderful dad at the front. Um, sorry for those that are listening, you can't see the picture. But, um, you know, and when I look at that picture, I've got two brothers and a sister, um, a wonderful mum and dad. Um, and that's abundance. You know, and my son, that is pure abundance. And my house, abundance. Okay, it might not be the five bed country house that I always wanted or um, the place, the glass fronted place by the sea, but that's all, that's all possible. And that's all still doable. Um, so that's kind of a lot of my backstory in, ter in terms of shaping the person that I am today. And the reason why I wanted to start the Never Settle podcast was because I haven't settled, although I haven't made it in whatever it is I'm going to make it in, because I seem to still not have settled on what wrong choice of word, but I still have not felt what that strong pull is for that purpose. I'm one of them, jack of all, master of none. I've got so many interests. I'm playing guitar, I'm singing. I can write songs. I haven't done it for a long time. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'm dabbling in crypto. Um, I'm in sales. I've started to do some coaching. Um, thinking about doing some other businesses. And, and I love all things spiritual. Crystals, tarot cards, you name it. I love yoga. I'm a Reiki healer um, and obviously a property developer. And I suppose going through this journey, I'm always learning and I'm always looking for, I don't know whether it's looking, I don't know whether that's the right phrase, but I'm always hungry for more. Um, I'm not one of these that's just gonna sit and, uh, at the telly every night and watch Netflix. Although don't get me wrong, I do like doing that once in a while. But, you know, very often I'm not sitting down till 10 o'clock if I've been playing the guitar or if I've been doing some coaching or um, doing this podcast. So obviously I'm doing this podcast now, which is um, a, a very new venture for me. So it's, for me, the not settle is not settle for me mediocrity in anything. You know, I, I had the balls to tell my husband I didn't love him and I ended the marriage. I've had the balls to um, go and invest in property. Um, and that's been a success. It's, it's not been, uh, you know, it didn't grow like I thought it was going to grow in the, in the earlier days. But again, never say never. Um, you know, I've, I do a job that most people would be scared of in terms of sales and being out on the road and all the rest of it. People can't believe, you know, the amount of miles I do and all that. And, you know, I'm always doing something. I'm always reading. I love reading. I love um, 
self-development. I love videos, watching stuff on YouTube. I love spirituality, Abraham Hicks, Wayne Dwyer, uh, all of that, you know, and there's just a thirst in me for more and for more and for more because I don't, I think the day you stop learning is the day you die pretty much. And everybody's different. You know, I know some people that live in their youth, you know, they still play the same music that they've always played since they were in their twenties. Um, and they can't move on from that. They don't, then they don't bother with new music or for me, I'm not saying I'm, I'm down with the kids, but I do like new stuff. You know, I do try and keep up to date with stuff and it's all about growing. It's all about expanding. It's all about, there's so much in this world, so much, especially with the internet. Jesus, we, we get flooded, don't we? With all the information, all the video content that you can get, you know, Instagram and all that. You can go cross-eyed with it all, but the, the thirst for life and the, the thirst for travel, you know, I did a lot of traveling over the last um, couple of years. Um, got into online marketing, met some amazing people through that and still, still great friends with a lot of them. And it's just knowing that there's just so much more that life can offer you. And you know, I've done ayahuasca. I'm not going to go into it now. If you don't know what that is, Google it. Um, last year I did Landmark, which is a self-development um, program, which admittedly I've got a love-hate relationship with, but, you know, that certainly helped me to improve some of the relationships that I had in my family at the time. And they have gone on to be bigger and better and stronger as a result of it. Um, you know, so many people live in unhappy relationships, um, live not talking to family members for years and years and years, um, even their children, you know, live doing a shit job that they, they hate, that they've been doing for 10 years because, well, what else am I going to do? Well, if you don't try, you don't know, you know, and I just... I used to get frustrated with people, um, you know, when I was younger. Come on, there's so much more out there. But as I've got older and wiser, hopefully, I've realised that, you know, when, the, when the, the classic, isn't it, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear and everybody's got to be ready. You know, it took me. I wasn't born like this. It was late 20s for me when I, um, I think I was 20, yeah, late twenties when I got into property uh, and the spirituality side, although I always knew it was there, it was losing my dad really that, that accelerated that. And that was in 2006. So since then I've been on a real spiritual journey, which has opened me up a lot more. Um, and in lots of ways has slowed me down because I used to be a right Tasmanian devil with everything, you know, racing here, racing there. And some would argue I still am, but I'm nowhere near what I used to be. Um, and I, I certainly don't bite at things like I used to either. I'm, I'm a lot more chilled um, in myself and accepting of things and realise, and, you know, and the other thing is, I don't care what people think, really. Um, there's still times where it, it, it bothers me, but most of the time I don't. Um, people are going to believe and say what they're going to believe and say. And it's none of my business. And actually... As humans, we spend too much time worrying about what other people think when the reality is, even if somebody has said something derogatory about you, I don't know, a week ago, for example, the chances are they're not sat thinking of you all day, every day. They're getting on with their own life and thinking about themselves. So it really is irrelevant what other people think of you. So I guess I feel like I'm rambling a bit. Um, I hope that you know, if you're listening, you're getting some value from this. It, it was more to give you some perspective on me as a person and where this podcast has come from, because the one thing that frustrates me still is seeing people settling, settling in relationships, settling in the job. It happens all the time. I'm, I'm not going to be able to change the world, but um, I have been, you know, instrumental in helping people just being a sounding board, be, a word, be the word of reason, 
perspective, all of that sort of thing. And I have seen with my very eyes the change in some people, you know, people that really want to embrace it. Um, I've got a friend, a very good friend who I've been helping. I don't know, about a year or so. And the transformation has been so rewarding um, in terms of he was certainly had no very little self-worth and certainly settling for second best in the relationship. And I've seen him growing and I've seen him um, getting stronger and realizing more of his potential and, and putting new ideas into the fire and all that and, and left the relationship. And um, yeah, it's, it's really satisfying. And, and the coaching is something I keep toying with whether it's going to become a full-time thing or not, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, to see people settle in makes me unhappy. And if I can help in any way, whether it be a sounding board, whether it be the voice of reason, whether it just be somebody to sit and listen and say nothing so you can say what you need to say and get it off your chest and come to your own conclusion, because that's the most powerful thing you can ever do, come to your own conclusion because we all know deep down what the truth is. Whether we want to admit it or not, we all know deep down what our truth is and whether that relationship we are sat in is right or wrong. Whether the career we're doing or the job we're doing or the getting by that we're doing, the potential that we've all got, you know, the dreams that we had as kids, what happened to them? Very few people get to live those dreams from kids and it's such a bloody shame. But if you, if I could leave this podcast or this episode with, I suppose, one thought or two thoughts, um, one is ask yourself, just sit there quietly, eyes open, eyes closed, whatever you want, and just ask yourself, what am I settling for? And if you give yourself enough space for inspiration to come to you, the answers will come. And the other thought is, what was it when I was at school that I thought I was gonna be? What was it that used to make me excited? What was it that used to make me passionate, make me laugh, make me get out of bed, make me excited? Um, the dreams, you know, sitting there in the day, dr daydreaming about, I mean, I wanted to be everything, surprise, surprise. I was gonna be a hairdresser, I was gonna be an astronomer, I was gonna be a psychologist. I think I even wanted to be a truck driver at one point. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, and go, go back to when you were a kid and remember what it is that got you, got you feeling full of life. And whatever that thing is, it's never too late. Why not? Why not? The possibilities are endless. If we really, really open ourselves up and actually surrender and that's something that i'm learning more and more to do rather than chase 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 and and be disappointed um when i don't quite make it or even if i do make it what's the next thing then what's the next thing then what's the next thing because once you've got to that particular goal there's always another goal right um so you're never quite there you're never quite satisfied and, and the satisfaction lasts not very long anyway um, so yeah, so surrender is one of the things that I'm learning to do more and more and allow more intuition and more inspiration, which is why I think I'm still floundering at the moment because I'm not pushing for anything. I'm just waiting to see what shows up. So yeah, think about when you were a kid, what got you excited and ask yourself, what are you settling for? And whatever that intuition is, maybe you can do something about it. Um, if you want to reach out to me, you can do. I'm on Facebook. Um, I have Mel Clark Coaching. And, um, well, this will be at the end of the podcast anyway, um, how you can get hold of me. Um, or you can just, obviously, uh, I've got Mel, Mel Clark. I've got two pages. I've got Mel Clark and I've got Mel Clark coaching. Um, 
I've also got an affiliate website, which is laptoplifeonline.com. Um, and you can find me there, or you can find me on Instagram, um, or you can find me on YouTube. So I will love you and leave you. Um, hope you've enjoyed my bit of a ramble and getting to know me a bit more. And um, see you on the next one. Thanks, guys.